Imagine what kind of a Muslim you would have to be, how despicable you would have to be, how putrid you would have to be. That when you, you see the suffering of the Ummah, you see the death and the killing, you see the mourning of the Ummah, that you would think that this is a time now for you to come out to mock the Ummah, to mock the suffering of the Ummah, to mock the killing and the martyrdom of Muslims. When even the Kuffar, the non-Muslims, they themselves realize the stand and the bravery and the suffering of these people. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa La Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Tanzilihi Al Azim in Suratu Ali Imran Ata Audu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajim Ma can Allah Liyadar Al Mu'minin Ala Ma Antum Alayhi Hatta Yamiz Al Khabitha Min Al Tayyib وما كان الله ليطلعكم على الغيب ولكن الله يجتبي من رسله من يشاء فآمنوا بالله ورسله وإن تؤمنوا وتتقوا فلكم أجر عظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to leave the Muslims in the situation they're in حَتَّى يَمِيزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies and differentiates the khabith, the putrid one, the despicable one, the hypocrites من الطيب From the pure ones, from the believers, from the steadfast ones This and many many other verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear time and time again that Allah is going to put the ummah through tests, through tribulations, through calamities. And one of the wisdoms of these tests is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use this incident, will use this moment to purify the ranks of the believers so that we can clearly see who's on the side of the ummah, who are the believers, who feels for the suffering of the ummah, and who are the hypocrites that are embedded within the ummah to cause this unity, this unity and weakness in the ummah. As we sit back and watch the events of the last year or so, and we see the butchering, we see the killing, tens of thousands of children murdered, genocided, women, all of Gaza almost completely destroyed. As our hearts bleed and we feel the pain and the sadness. But it is through these calamities and these tribulations, one thing, one outcome out of all of this, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these events to purify the Muslims and to bring clarity to the Ummah. Why are we in this condition? Why has this been left to go on for such a long time? Why isn't anyone helping? And all the lies become exposed. For many, for many years, the Muslims were fooled by the Muslim governments. They were fooled by the Muslim rulers. But now, every single person can see for the last year, they have all stood back and done absolutely nothing. Not only done nothing, but they've been complicit and protecting the state that's butchering and killing. So all these, nobody has hope in these leaders. Nobody has hope in these governments. And the Muslims understand more than ever that unless we have righteous leaders and unless we have the Muslims have unity, the situation will never ever change. Now, we, the Muslims never thought like this if you go back two years, four years, five years ago. But now you hardly come across anyone that is not aware of the reality of the Muslim governments and tyrants in the Muslim world. Also, this whole international norm uh, the United Nations, these Western powers, these beacons of democracy and human rights, they have all been exposed for their double standards and for directly funding and aiding this genocide that is taking place. This is all exposed for the Ummah, not only for the Muslims, even the non-Muslims can see the hypocrisy and the double standards. But more than this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies the individuals so that we can even amongst us, all these... Uh, uh, channels that we see, all these scholars that we see, all these social media influencers that talk about Quran and, and Sunnah and give uh, talk after talk, lecture after lecture. They have millions and some of them millions and millions of followers. When you see that this person, he's got some 10 million followers, yet never spoken a word, never added anything, barely mentioned Gaza or, or, or the genocide. Then you know the reality of this person. You know this person, he's there for the hits. He's there for the money. He's there to save a platform and an image. And he's not going to sacrifice that platform and that image to call out what is going on. And then you see other accounts the whole time fooling the people, saying we call to Quran and Sunnah and to Tawheed. And it's amazing, subhanAllah, you know, some of the reactions, um, specifically after the death 
uh, of the Shaheed, rahimahullah, after the death of Yahya Sinwar. This event now more than ever, it's really, you know, uh, sifting and, and purifying the ummah. And you see this all in the reaction. When you see people coming out to mock the Muslims and make fun of the Muslims, then you know what these actual individuals really are. And when you can, it's interesting that, you know, the, the, the death of Sinwar, um, rahimahullah, it's interesting to see the reactions. You, you, you look at some of these online platforms and you see their reactions and you see some of the reactions from the non-Muslims themselves, from the kuffar. People don't even, some of them don't even care about Islam, they don't even like Muslims. And you contrast the two reactions and it's absolutely amazing the way um, this event, what it's doing to, to, to the online scene, to, 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 to the da'wah, to the whole world. Now some of these really despicable individuals, I mean subhanAllah, you, just, you, just, you can't believe that uh, individuals like this exist. Here, you know, this, this uh, Abu Mus'ab Wajdi Al-Aqari, this guy has been known for a while now. But after the death of Sinwar and Suleiman Ruhaili, who's a Saudi scholar, he, he made a post in Arabic and he's gone on about um, uh, the difference with Ahl Sunnah and Ikhwan and look at their, what they're doing and, and it's all because of them, the Palestinians have been butchered. So this guy, Abu Mus'ab, what does he say? How true? All day crying when one of their leaders dies. dies. Or every day hundreds of innocent Muslims get killed like it's a standard price for the militia to prosper and preserve. Ikhwanis and his sub-branches are an ongoing calamity upon the Muslims, Shia lovers. No, Mr. Aqari, what's an ongoing calamity upon the Muslims, and alhamdulillah now is, is, is exposing you guys, is these hypo hypocrites amongst us, that when the Muslims are, are mourning, you sit there and mock and make fun of them, all day crying when one of their leaders dies. These are the hypocrites that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exposing, exposing them. They're rejoicing. So here you have this other account, Abdul, Abdul Latif ibn Abdullah al-Shaykh. I think they're a famous Saudi family. Okay, he tweets out in Arabic and I've translated that our joy today is very great with the death of Sinwar. Congratulations to every Arab and Muslim in the East and West uh, uh, of the earth. All right. Um, and he's, subhanallah, imagine like somebody like uh, <laughs> so comes out and, and, and tweets like this, congratulating uh, the Muslims. And subhanallah, it's mind boggling. Um, all these hypocrites, they're all being exposed. And subhanallah, you find that during these times of calamities, when the Muslims are finally gaining clarity, when the Muslims see the reality of everything that's happening, see the reality of the Muslim law, the Muslim tyrants, the Muslim governments, the Western powers. All right? These kinds of people that are embedded in the Ummah, they're giving, given online platforms uh, that, that they buy and they set them up with bots and pay people to be their followers, give them a loud voice, the algorithms push them. Why? To, to de delegitimize the stance of the Muslims, to de de delegitimize uh, the Palestinians and their resistance to dehumanize them, to paint them out to be the problem. They're the issue. It's not the Muslim governments. It's not the state that's killing them and all the funding that's getting them. No, as uh, um, uh, Shamsi famously said, the Palestinians, these guys, what, what are you worried about Palestinians for? They're mushrikun. They're all grave worshippers. Right. You have him and uh, Rabbi Faris Al Hamadi, who's got like a million followers on, on TikTok, right? When they were making fun of the boycotts, uh, mocking the Muslims for the boycotts, right? These individuals they're embedded in the Ummah to to this cause disunity and hatred in the Muslims, to turn you against any kind of, 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 of resistance in the Ummah, to divert you away from the real problem, the Muslim tyrants, the Muslim governments, the Western colonial powers that are funding all of this. Now let's push it back. The Palestinians, the Mushrikun, they signed the peace treaty, they broke the peace treaty. We tried to help, the Arab regimes tried helping them, but they didn't want our help. Now, these people are intentionally given these platforms and the algorithm pushed them to make them seem like a loud voice that it's embedded in the Ummah. But don't be disillusioned by a lot of these voices. Majority of them, this is the reality of them, the majority of them, they're not, they're hypocrites. And when you see like somebody like Rabbi Faris al-Hamadi has like a million followers, there's no way a million Muslims could be listening to this guy or following him. Most of them are bots, most of them are paid. 
to, an algorithm pushes him to make it seem like there's a there's, there's a significant portion of the ummah that follows these people or thinks like these people. And alhamdulillah, these people now are being completely exposed for what they are. You know, to show you how these people are being exposed, uh, I listen. Uh, I've been listening a lot in, on Arabic YouTube and you, when you go into Arabic YouTube, if you understand Arabic, there's all these other voices that you're not privy to when you listen in English. And one prominent person, his name is Muhammad Chamsuddin, he's got like something like 800,000 followers on his main channel and he's all got all these other subsidiary channels and they've got hundreds of thousands of followers. And this person comes out, you know, the Muslims were waiting for him or in the comments like, are you going to speak about what happened? Are you going to speak about Sanwar? He comes out and he puts Sinwar in the picture and he puts it as part of the title. And for 15 or 20 minutes of his program, before he starts his program, he just speaks absolute gibberish. He doesn't mention him by name. He doesn't mention the Palestinians by name. He doesn't mention who's doing what to him. He doesn't mention the Muslim governments or tyrant leaders. He just speaks generically. I'm so sad. Sometimes I can watch and sometimes I can't bear to watch. Uh, the whole thing is confusing. I don't really want know what to do. He doesn't even make dua for them. Right? He just makes a random dua. We hope Allah brings some khair. Right? And then he continues his normal programs taking questions. A lot of them, when you go and read the comments, and you go to, a, you can find this channel, Muhammad Shamsuddin in Arabic, and you see that video titled Sinwar. And you can translate the comments if you don't know Arabic. Right? But you see a lot of the comments, people are just shocked. They're like, what did I just listen to? I just listened to 15, 20 minutes of gibberish. You didn't speak about anyone. You didn't mention anyone by name. You didn't make dua for anyone. You didn't really tell us anything about the situation. I can't believe I was following you this whole time. You see comment after comment. I was fooled by you. Now I know what you really are. It was just a waste of time. I can't believe I wasted 20 minutes listening to gibberish. And this is how, and, and what, what does he do? What's this guy's normal programming? The next day, next day he resumes his normal programming. And what's, what's it about? Imam Nawawi. <laughs> Right? What does he think about Imam, Imam Nawi? He's a deviant. Right? He's got corruption in his aqidah. He's got corruption in his belief. And this is how he spends most of his videos. Ibn Hajar, Imam Nawi, you know. One of his clips went viral. Where somebody was asking him a question, is Imam Nawi a kafir? He said, look, if you think the Ash'ariya, a kuffar, then yes, he's a kafir. <laughs> it's like so laid back, so casually. Somebody's asking him if Imam Nawi is a kafir. He said, if you think the Ash'ariya, Kuffar, then yes, he's a kafir, and this is how he spends the majority of his time, just attacking his, uh, uh, scholars, attacking Ibn Hajar, the classical scholars, Imam Nawi, and causing uh, uh, entrenching this issue of Athari Salafi versus Ashari. Now, all of these accounts are being exposed, and I believe a lot of them, without mentioning specifics, but intentionally planted in the Ummah. I don't believe people actually listen to these people or any Muslims follow them, especially now, but they're planted in the Ummah to cause disunity in the Ummah, to cause hatred in the Ummah, to divert the Ummah away from the real situation and the real issues. And all these hypocrites are now being exposed. And, and the hypocrisy is being exposed even more because when you look at the reaction, uh, you look at some of the reaction of the non-Muslims, and it's interesting to read some of the tweets uh, that are being put out by the non-Muslims themselves about the death of Sinwar. So it's interesting to look at some of these social media feeds and look at some of the reactions. So you have this channel, Catelyn Johnst uh, Johnstone, and she responds to this guy, Vizgar24, he says, last photo of Yihar Sinwar in this world, he was hiding behind some chairs like a coward. What does she say? She goes, he died fighting off soldiers, drones, and an effing tank with one arm. Western media jerk off fantasizing about dying like that and then go off to die in nursing homes from Parkinson's complications with bellies full of vanilla custard. You don't get to, to call him a coward. And she points out, you know, this irony, you know, when you watch Western movies and, and they show them these heroic fighters making a last stand and they die for honor and, and protecting their comrades, all right? When we see this in movies, everybody fantasizes about this. And she goes, Western men, they fantasize about this, right? But in reality, they die from diseases on their beds. And you look at some other, so on this channel, Suppressed News, he says, Israel's biggest mistake was releasing the video of Mata Yahya Sinwar's final moments. He is seen wounded with one hand almost completely severed, fighting until the end with a stick. Out of arrogance, they unintentionally created an eternal legend.
Israel killed Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas and mastermind behind October 7th, and at the same time, accidentally turned into a symbol of Palestinian resistance. Israel has spent the last year painting Sinwar as a coward, as someone who abandoned his own people, as a billionaire who lives in Saudi Arabia, who's staying in a fancy hotel as his people are slaughtered. But the video Israel released today, the drone footage showing his final moments, proved the complete opposite. The video shows Sinwar sitting in an armchair in a bombed out building, cradling an arm injury he received in an earlier battle. He had tried making a emergency tourniquet using an electrical cord, and as his drone flies into the building and he's confronted by it, knowing that Israel's about to shell the building, does he run? Does he flee? No. To his last breath, Sinwar resisted. He begins throwing objects at the drone, knowing that his death is coming. Despite all the work spent to paint Sinwar as a coward, as someone who sold out his own people, in the end it was Israel who proved that he was a fighter and that he stood for Palestinian freedom. He stood for what he believed in until his last breath. Say yeah, what you it's want. It's amazing you, to see the contrast in reaction. You look at this channel, some you know young white guy, non-Muslim, okay? What does he care about any of this? But he sits there and, and details what happened how they try to uh, paint him out uh, as a monster and how uh, he's a coward and he's hiding. And then they, they actually uh, uh, release the footage of everything that happened. And what's the reaction, he says? They turn him into a legend. They turn him into a hero. And, you know, this is, this is, this is nothing to do with Islam or Muslims or non-Muslims. Human beings, right, throughout all of history, there's endless amounts of stories of last stands of great heroes fighting to the death, you know, against all odds. You think about all the, all the stories and incidents that you see in the movies and uh, uh, the way they present them as these, as, these, as these great heroes and their sacrifices and, you know, right? And everybody, when you're in the, watching these movies and seeing these characters, everybody loves these characters. Everybody fantasizes about the heroism and these kinds of deaths, right? And you have legends, you know, that last till, till today from thousands of years ago, like the, the, the ancient Greeks, the 300 Spartans that took on hundreds of thousands uh, of, of, of the Persian army at that time. Right? They took one last stand and they fought to the last man. And they still, that legend, they still remember it to today. They still make comics about it today. They still make movies about, about it today. This is a universal human thing. Even if you dis there's a people that you dislike, even if he's your enemy, but everybody can appreciate heroism. Everybody can appreciate somebody uh, sacrificing their lives for their people. Everybody can appreciate people that are not cowardly. They're courageous. They're brave. This is a human sentiment. And it's amazing to see that even these non-Muslims, the way now that they view this whole incident, the way they're even speaking about him, and that's just the whole public perception of what is happening in Gaza and what is happening in Palestine and the Zionist state that's been building up, spent billions of dollars of, of, of propaganda to build this image, now that is all completely breaking down. And subhanAllah, you know, um, as I said, you know, human humankind, um, they, they write poems, they remember their history about last stands, about heroic moments. It reminds me of an incident um, from the Sirah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a great battle the, called the Battle of Mu'ta. This was like in the seventh year of Hijrah, roughly about that time. The Prophet was in Medina. And at that time, you know, outside the Arabian Peninsula, there was two main superpowers, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. Up until that time, Prophet had fought all the battles against the Mushrikun uh, and against the Arabs. The Muslims had not yet fought the superpowers. They had not yet fought the Romans. So the Prophet ﷺ sends an army of 3,000 of the companions and he puts Zayd ibn Haritha عنه, his freed slave as the leader of that army and he gives clear instructions. He said to them وسلم, if Zayd is killed then Jafar ibn Abd Abdul Muttalib the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, he is to become the leader. If Jafar is killed then Abdullah ibn Rawaha the Ansari he will be your leader. Foresha foreshadowing because the Prophet ﷺ had wahi that the battle is going to be intense. So the Muslims set off to a place called Mu'ta, which is in Bilad al-Sham. And Bilad al-Sham at that time had been conquered by the Romans, the Byzantine Empire, right, who were Christian. So when the Muslims were about to reach the area, They reach, news reached them that the army that was amassed against them was over 100,000 of the Romans and the Arabs, the Arab Christians. Now when the news reached them, the companions were shocked. They had 3,000. In the armies that they faced against Quraysh, right, uh, the biggest army that had come against them was 10,000 at the Battle of Al Ahzab, the Battle of the Trench. So, for a lot of them, they probably wouldn't even imagine that you could amass such a number just as soldiers in an army. 
So they were shocked by the news. And some of them thought they were a bit hesitant. Should we continue? Should we write back to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Abdullah ibn Rawah had the answer. He said to them, look, what are you afraid of? You're going to be given two, uh, one of two things. Either Allah will give you victory or you be, you'll die in battle when you gain martyrdom. Right? And you return to Allah as a martyr. So he restrengthened them, reignited their iman. So they set out to meet this Roman army. When they went out, imagine 3,000 meeting over 100,000 of the enemy. It's like you're in the ocean and just waves are crashing upon you and you're surrounded from every corner. And this is how the companions felt. So Zaid al-Harifa, he grabbed the standard right, and he rushed himself into the enemy, fighting, killing, striking, left, right and center, but wherever, tur wherever he turned, it's just an endless wave of enemies until he was cut down and martyred. Jafar radiallahu anhu, when he saw the standard fall and he saw their general Zaid was killed, he rushed to grab the standard and he raised the standard up high, but he looked in front of him and he saw just an ocean and he had a bit of hesitancy in his heart. And he, he, he was afraid that he was going to flee and turn around. So he comes down from his horse. He, he cripples his horse. So there is no option to flee. And he rushes and he faces the enemy with the standard. So they rush at him and he fights. They cut off one of his limbs. So he grabs the standard with his left hand. Then they cut his left hand. So now he hugs the standard with his limbs. And he continues to raise it and rush into the enemy. Until they finally one Roman comes to him and cuts him in half. And then Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu, he assumes the leadership and he rushes into the enemy and he fights in the ocean of soldiers until he too gains martyrdom. And that's when Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, he was still a new Muslim. Maybe he had been a Muslim for a few months. The Muslims gather around him. They choose him as their commander and he performs some military tactics. And the Roman army withdraws because they thought the Muslims received reinforcements. And then Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, when the Romans stopped attacking, he moves the Muslim army back. The sword of Allah radiallahu anhu. Now, in the later narrations, the companions, they said, when we came across the body of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, they said, we found over 50 strikes of the sword and the spear in his body. And we did not find a single strike on his back. Meaning he never turned his back to the enemy. He never fled from the enemy. He never showed any fear. No retreat. No surrender. To his last breath he fought and he held the standard until they cut him to pieces. These are the stories in our past. These are the stories of the heroes in Islam. Bravery, courage, sacrifice. No retreating. No surrender. You're willing to do everything to protect and, 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 and persevere for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the stories and this is what all humanity, Muslim or non-Muslim, everybody recognizes courage, everybody recognizes bravery, whether the, he's an enemy of yours or not, this is just human instinct and human history. So do not be um, disheartened. It's been a difficult year for the Ummah. Um, the chaos and the slaughter and the genocide and it's still continuous and it hasn't stopped and Allahu A'lam the Zionists have much bigger plans but in the end we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down a plan and we have complete yaqeen and certainty in the plan of Allah and in the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the Ummah has to go through trials the Ummah has to go through calamities and one of the, the purposes, one of the results that Allah Taala tells us many, many times in the Quran, حتى يميز الخبيث من الطيب. Allah is going to purify your ranks from the despicable, putrid, treacherous ones. And Allah is going to show you who are the pure ones, who are the pure scholars, who are the pure leaders, who are going to lead the Ummah forward. And in the end, it's essential that the, the, the hypocrites are cleansed from our ranks. We know the hypocrites caused a lot of problems for the Messenger Wasallam. Until Allah cleansed the companions from the hypocrites, then they were able for Islam to flourish. And we're going to go through the same stages. Allah is sending the Ummah through these same stages. By the time this is over and these tests and trials, the Ummah will have absolute clarity on who the true leaders are, who the true scholars are, who are the true da'wah carriers. And all those hypocrites that mock and make fun of the Muslims and call the Palestinians mushrikeen and say um, mock and laugh at boycotts and it's the fault of the Palestinians, they're breaking the peace treaties. All of these hypocrites are being exposed. And in the end, don't think that the Muslims feel like this. But these are people that are embedded in the Ummah. They're given platforms. They're funded. 
to make you feel like that this is how the Muslims feel. So do not be deceived by them. And have certainty in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakumullah khairan. If you found uh, this video beneficial, please like the video, please comment on the video, and please support and subscribe to the channel.